Well, happy Easter. Welcome to each of you. Wherever you are celebrating with us today, I'm glad you gathered with us online. Uh, we're celebrating today that Jesus lives, which, by the way, is an entirely different statement than saying Jesus lived. The majority of the world believes Jesus lived. Every major religion and any respectable historian recognizes that a man named Jesus of Nazareth, a, a good man, a, a teacher, possibly a prophet, lived. We, however, celebrate much more than that. We are the believers in the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've staked everything on these two words. Jesus lives. Say that. Jesus lives. On that Friday afternoon, he died. And as he cried out, it is finished, his followers' world came crashing down. It was the darkest, most hopeless and confusing day of their lives. They didn't understand his suffering, even though they knew the book of Isaiah, where 700 years before the death of Christ, the prophet had described the Messiah's suffering in detail. Listen to what Isaiah wrote about Jesus. He suffered the things we should have suffered. He took on himself the pain that should have been ours. But we thought God was punishing him. We thought God was wounding him and making him suffer. But the servant was pierced because we had sinned. He was crushed because we had done what was evil. He was punished to make us whole again. His wounds have healed us. So Isaiah had warned them, but still, how could they understand that the prophet had been talking about their beloved teacher, uh, even Jesus himself? He spelled it out repeatedly as the weekend approached. But he, when he was actually arrested, tried, and then executed, they didn't remember. On Thursday night, as Jesus was taken, all the men had fled from Gethsemane. All the men, that is, except Peter and John, who followed the police to the high priest's home. But then, during Christ's midnight trials, Peter got spooked and reflexively denied ever knowing Jesus. The next day, only John was there at the cross with those brave women. The cross. Such a confusing place for them. Because not only was their beloved teacher being unfairly executed, but recently, Jesus' closest followers had come to understand that their rabbi was much more than a miracle-working Bible teacher. Jesus was the only son of the only God. So his death took them all by surprise. I mean, you just don't kill God. But they had seen Jesus die. Christ was buried in a nearby tomb by two good men, Joseph and Nicodemus, who took his lifeless body down off the cross, quickly wrapped it, and placed it in Joseph's family crypt. In a twist of irony, these two devout Jews were rushing to complete this gruesome task before sunset in order to keep Sabbath law. Their religion was so convoluted that the religious leaders killed the Son of God, but then these men rushed to bury him before sundown so they wouldn't break Sabbath rules. Several of the women who had been at the cross watched them from a safe distance as the men hurriedly wrapped the lifeless body, laid it in a cave, and then struggled to roll a heavy stone across the only entrance as the sun set on Friday. And then Friday night led to Saturday morning, the first Sabbath they had not been with Jesus for over three years. Must have been terrible. Then on Sunday morning, the women gathered supplies before sunrise and headed back to the garden tomb. They wondered how they would convince the guards to move the heavy stone and let them into the cave. They loved Jesus because he had loved them. Not only did he love them, he, he respected them. He had included them with the men, women, learning alongside men. It was unheard of. But all that was over now. He was dead. As they walked together in the pre-dawn light, their hearts were heavy as they, they tried to make sense of what had happened. What now? Where do we go from here? They steeled themselves for the unpleasant task at hand. Jesus' body had laid there since Friday. They would be unwrapping him, 
Then washing the dried blood from his wounded hands, his feet, his back, the terrible gash in his side. They would be gazing at his face one last time, a face brutally marred by wounds from jagged thorns. Wouldn't be easy for them to see him like this, but they were more than willing. It was the final way they could honor him and say their goodbyes to the man they had believed to be the Messiah and the Son of God. But then, when they arrived at the tomb, nothing was how they had left it. The guards were gone, the stone had been moved, the cave was open. Luke tells us about it in chapter 24 of his Jesus biography. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the angel said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the son of man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men, be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Years later, when one of those men, Matthew, writes his account of the time they spent with Christ, he makes one thing very clear. Jesus warned us ahead of time that he would be killed. He gave us very specific details. Jesus explained to his disciples in Matthew 16 that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hand of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and he must be killed, and on the third day, be raised to life. One chapter later, Jesus says it all again. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day, he will be raised to life. Then, as they all approach Jerusalem for the last time, Christ repeated himself again. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Well, Jesus warned him over and over. In hindsight, knowing what Matthew just told us about the repeated and specific details Jesus had given them, I wish that when the women ran home on Sunday morning to tell the, the men that they had just talked to angels who had told them Christ was alive, I wish that at least one of these guys would have remembered Christ's repeated predictions. Just one guy could have had his shining moment of faith right here. I wish one of the men would have believed the women and said, wait, wait. This is what Jesus told us was going to happen on the third day. But none of them said anything like that. No one remembered. Probably because so many things Christ said over the last three years were really difficult to understand. Even though the same exact group were at Bethany when Jesus raised his friend Lazarus, who had been dead for four days, it still didn't occur to them that if Jesus could wake Lazarus and call him out of a tomb, then God the Father could wake his own son. So, when the women returned to them saying, we just talked to angels, Jesus is alive, the men did not believe the women because their words sounded like nonsense. You know, it's a powerful word, nonsense. This is one of the elements of the story that makes it ring true. Think about it. Think about how women were viewed back then. If this was made up, no first century author would have written a story where women were the first eyewitnesses to Christ's resurrection. It's just how things were back then. Women were, were viewed as less intelligent, less reliable with the facts, more emotional than men. These authors would not have told it this way where all the men are fearful and confused and all the women are bold and believe. And if these men were making it up, it would read more like this. We knew it was gonna happen. It was the happiest Sunday morning of our lives. We woke up that day ready to celebrate what we knew was gonna happen. Christ had prepared us well. We knew that Friday was gonna be awful. 
But then on Sunday, Jesus would come back to life. He had told us those exact words. Peter, James, and John took us to the tomb before sunrise. The excitement built as the sun peeked over the horizon. We were ready for Jesus to come back to us. But that's not what this story says. That's what helps us know it's a true story. It says, Jesus warned us, and we didn't see it coming at all. We didn't believe the women, and we didn't believe our two friends who had encountered Christ on the Emmaus Road. Listen to Luke tell it. Jesus himself stood among them. This is uh, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening. He stood among them and said, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands, my feet. It's me. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones. I have flesh and bones. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you what would happen. Then for 40 wonderful days after that Sunday, hundreds of eyewitnesses saw Jesus, talked to Jesus, and touched Jesus. And none of Jesus' sworn enemies could do anything to stop Christ's followers because everyone in Jerusalem knew that Jesus from Nazareth had somehow come back to life on a Sunday after a Roman execution on a Friday. The resurrection of Jesus from Nazareth was such a well-known fact, so accepted by everyone in Jerusalem, that 50 days after it happened, when Peter explained why Jesus had defeated death in that amazing sermon, 3,000 people signed up in one day. Over 3,000 baptized believers filled with the Holy Spirit. And the first church is born based on this one truth, that on a Friday, Jesus took away our sins. And on a Sunday, Jesus gave us eternal life. Thousands of people at the same time on that Pentecost Sunday let go of their shame. Thousands of people begin to live new lives as part of a new community called the church. On that day, everything changed for them. Like it changes for us when we first believed that Jesus died for us and now lives for us. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, changes everything for those who believe. It changes how we live here and now. It changes how we live after we die. And today, Christians all over the world are celebrating Easter, reminding each other of how much we have to celebrate on this holiday. He died on a Friday, taking our sins upon his shoulders. If we can be forgiven of our sins, if we can be given a clean slate, this changes everything for us. And he rose again on a Sunday, opening the doorway for us into eternal life. If we can be free of our fear of death, we can really live. So Christians are the Easter people, whole communities of former sinners now free from condemnation, free from shame, and already eternally alive. Basing everything we do, everything we hope for, not upon, not upon something that we can accomplish, but on what he accomplished when his death secured our pardon and his resurrection gave us eternal life. We can be free from the power sin has over us to shame us, to hold us back. We can be free from the power death had over us. And that's what we've come to celebrate today. We celebrate Jesus who said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me will live and never die. Like the Apostle Paul wrote in the letter to the Christ followers at Colossae, when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the evil powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. 
This is what Jesus said to the Apostle John when Christ appeared to him on Patmos Island. Fear not, he said. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. I took the keys of death. <sighs> wow. This past year, because of this evil virus, we all have come face to face with death. Sickness and death have been constantly on our minds. But what changes today as we celebrate Jesus is that we remind ourselves of the one who heals our diseases and raises us from the dead. So this is a very special Easter to us because Christ defeated death. Not so that we will never physically die, but when death does take us, it just takes us to be with the Lord. We just enter into the eternal reward that Jesus won for us when he took away our sins and gave us eternal life. We believers pin our hopes on the death and resurrection of Jesus, receiving this gift of life that he freely gives us, a gift that takes away our fear. Well, after his resurrection, Jesus hung out with the disciples for six weeks, preparing them to lead his church. He went back through everything he taught them and then told them that his spirit would come to make them brave and give them the ability to lead. And we see a marked change in them. Now they seem fearless. Part of that boldness was based on their newfound lack of fear about their own mortality. Death just didn't scare them like it had in the past. Where before they had run, now they were boldly stepping out and preaching the gospel of the resurrected Christ. They began to understand that if they were in Christ, their death was not fatal. And they loved each other. And they loved their neighbors more than they feared Christ's enemies. And that can be the same for us. When we really begin to believe the truth about the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, we become brave. We know what happens when a believer passes from death to life. Because of Christ, there is real life after our final breath. Jesus has turned death into something his followers survive. The writer of the New Testament book of Hebrews says it like this, by his death as a human being, Christ destroyed him who holds the power of death, freeing those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Friends, fear can hold us back. And the fear of death is the greatest fear. It can be a restrictive bondage that keeps us from living life. What, what might happen holds us back from taking healthy risks. If we can stop being so afraid, we can live a much better life. Mainly because of what Jesus said to Martha that day as they stood at her brother's gravesite. I'm the resurrection and the life. The person who believes in me will live, even though they die. Whoever believes in me while they're living will never die. Jesus has made us immortal. We already possess eternal life. So I think we need to start living like that. Because Jesus not only promised us life after death, he promised us life before death. When Christ defeated death, he did it for us. So he can take away our fear of sickness and our fear of death. And with that, that, with that fear removed, we are free to live out our God-given purpose, like the first disciples did. That's why Easter is such good news. Because freedom from fear is freedom to really live. When Christ said, I have come to give you an abundant full life, he was thinking of us. He was thinking of Easter 2021, after the cave we have lived in during 2020. Like Lazarus, he is calling us out now, saying, come out and live. Friends, Jesus lives. And because he lives, we live too. Like he said to the Apostle John, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I died, but look, I'm alive forever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. Pray with me now. 
Jesus, thank you for going through with it. Lord, you were there in the Garden of Gethsemane even, and we, we read the story of how terrifying this was for you, where you are not only looking death in the eye, you are looking evil in the eye. You are, you are taking the keys of death away from the evil one. And Lord, we just thank you for beating death and thank you for your resurrection, for coming back, and then, and then for re-explaining everything now based on the reality of your resurrection. Thank you for being patient with your disciples and thank you for being patient with us. And now, Lord, as we have entered into this new year, we do have new hope. Lord, we pray that you would start to release us of our fear of sickness and our fear of death as we cautiously move out and forward and we begin living our lives uh, in a full way again. We thank you, Lord, for being with us during 2020, for all that we learned. And now, Lord, we celebrate our freedom to live our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for Easter. Amen.